Well, you see Paul very much the intense young artist, and as a young artist, I, his talent was never in doubt. Um, yet his uh, search for a formative vision and language that would sustain him through decades of a creative life would follow a circuitous and seemingly contradictory route. After being noticed as a coming abstract painter, an acceptance he thought was too easily earned, uh, Rezica turned his back on the New York avant-garde. He chose instead to immerse himself in academic study of 16th century Venetian painting, a mode that his peers considered, uh, would you just wait on oh, that? Sure. That's okay. Um, uh, that uh, his peers considered irrelevant and obsolete. Um, yet when he went to Europe in 1950 to seek a classical education, he was perhaps exhibiting uh, the truest and most individual behaviors of a serious artist, that of um, re-examining the disdained, the ignored, and the undervalued for what it could teach him and what he could make his own. Um, as Eliot wrote in Four Quartets, in my beginning is my end, and this was the governing principle in Rezica's creative life. He departed on a quest only to circle back to his beginnings, but in maturity, armed with an enriched understanding of their meaning. And beyond his literal return to his roots in the New York School and color abstraction, uh, Resica more generally embodied the duality of wanderlust and homecoming in his artistic practice. In his mature work, his inclination is toward variants and serial approaches to an idea, um, strengthening each sequence as he works through it the first time and then uh, doubles back to it. So if we, I could have the next slide, thanks. Uh, Paul uh, was born on August 15th, 1928 in New York City. He was the only child uh, of Sonia Zeltzer, a Russian Jewish immigrant who arrived in the United States in 1920, and Abraham Rezica, uh, who was born in this country to Polish Jewish parents. Uh, Abraham Rezica was an en electrical engineer and later a businessman. Um, Paul always drew, and Sonia Rezica, a cultivated woman and an active communist, urged her son to be an artist. Uh, remembering his mother's enthusiasms, uh, Rezica said, I had to be either a painter, or if not a painter, I would have to be a revolutionary. I had to be either Stalin or Rubens. So by the age of 10, uh, Rezica was taking art classes on Saturdays and painting on his own during his spare time. Uh, he was enrolled in the children's section of the American Artist School, which uh, housed in the former uh, quarters of the John Reed Club on West 14th Street. The school was a citadel of social consciousness, and he studied watercolor, and he painted industrial subjects, and he gave them titles like The Spirit of the Worker. Um, so, and but... Um, in about uh, 1940, uh, Rezka's parents built a house uh, in Shrub Oak, New York, which is a rural area of Westchester County. And they bought the land from the family of the painter and printmaker, Pennerton West. She was a descendant of Benjamin West and affiliated with the uh, uh, haters, uh, Atelier 17. And she studied with Hoffman, and she became a mentor to Paul. And that was the beginning of the Hoffman co uh, connection. Um, at the same time, uh, Paul began painting, uh, had lessons with Saul Wilson, who was, um, and that continued from 1940 to 44. And um, Wilson specialized in romantic seascapes. And you see a very Wilson-inflected one here. And uh, Wilson was also represented by Babcock galleries, which exhibited um, painters like uh, Ryder, Blakelock, and Newman. And Rezica emulated Wilson's work. And could I have the next slide, please? Um, and visited the gallery when he was growing up. So, you know, there was no. Um, and you can see here the sort of uh, storm tossed seas and impasto of painters like Ryder and Newman and Saul uh, Wilson. Um, and you really see that this very crusty impasto of these early paintings kind of even suggest, even then, uh, Rezica's pleasure in you know, the amplitude, amplitude of the, the medium. The paint is almost nourishment for him. Now, even then, you know, the subject of the seas and before the small sailboat in a wide sea is a manifestation of that 
archetypal theme of uh, quest and return. It's a determination to cross to something on the other side. Now, during all this time when he's painting, he's a, a student at the recently established High School of Music and Art. And in 1945, he also um, began, um, uh, next slide, please, uh, ex uh, trying figurative compositions like this one, which is celestial ch chest with two very Picassoid uh, players. And that summer, while Resica was in Shrub Oak, um, Pennerton le West let him paint uh, in her barn, and she urged him then to study with Hoffman. So when he got back to Manhattan, he went to uh, high school during the day while attending night class at the Hoffman School at 52 West 8th Street, which is just down the block. Uh, one and a half blocks away, and in the Hoffman class, um, as a high school student, he became aware of Pollock and Gorky and de Kooning, and started going to galleries like uh, Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century. And um, let's see, um, next slide, please. You can see that um, this painting, Abstraction, uh, shows the influence of his teacher and of, of the avant-garde work and the galleries that he was seeing. I mean, it's really, uh, for someone in high school, an absolutely dazzling painting. It's very sure in its grasp of abstract rhythms. It's an all-over composition executed in high key colors, and it's, the marks are pictographic, uh, and it kind of dances on this palimpsest of um, uh, broadly brushed whites and blues. Um, and um, let's see, next slide, please. Uh, Resica also experimented with very lyrical biomorphic shapes, as you can see, indebted to Miro, as in this one, and also um, the, the, in Subway, this kind of geometric patterning and blunt contrast. So in 1940, this was all by 1946 when he graduated from high school. He wrote to Hoffman asking him for a post as a monitor, a working scholarship in the day school, and Hoffman accepted him. And Resica began uh, in September 46 uh, as a monitor in the class. And uh, the school was, uh, was certified for the GI Bill, so the student body swelled from roughly eight people per class to more than 50, and Resica took attendance and met all those important Hoffman students um, like Richard Stankiewicz, Jan Muller, um, Nick Caroni, um, Jane Freilicher, and Larry Rivers. So um, now, um, let's see, next slide, great. Um, Resica had a, uh, Abraham Resica had a, a motor shop um, on Upper Park Avenue, and Paul built a studio on the upper floor. Uh, of the building, and based on what he saw around him, he painted these semi-abstract sorts of canvases of the shop and its tools, and Motor Shop is sort of his homage to Guernica, which was then Resica's favorite painting, and um, then uh, he followed him to Provincetown in the summer, and as opposed to the winter classes, which were confined to drawing, uh, in the, the summer sessions, the students uh, painted, often from still lifes that Hoffman set up. And, uh, yeah, um, and he copied some of uh, Matisse's, mo uh, no, I guess we're not, we're not in there. But anyway, he, he was very much um, involved with Matisse and Picasso. And um, later on, he also um, showed the influence of, uh, he was influenced by Beckman's arrival in New York City in uh, 1947. Um, now, Resica was in several group shows at this point, but he was uneasy about his rather swift adoption of an abstract uh, idiom. He wanted to master genres within the traditional realm of the artist, landscapes and figure studies and nudes, and these uh, worries were natural given his age. He was expected, I mean, to be an, if he was an abstract painter, to strip his work bare, to reject an entire tangible world of objects and sensations well before he'd had enough time to move beyond a cursory um, exploration of them. And this was, this uncertainty was behind his decision not to return to Hoffman's classes in 1948. He felt the lack of uh, instruction in anatomy and perspective, but larger cultural events uh, affected him too, like Beckman's uh, arrival in the United States in 1947 and the Bonard retrospective in 1948 that had a great impact on him, uh, as with others of his generation. Um, so um, by 1950, uh, he was insisting that he needed more academic uh, training, especially in anatomical uh, drawing. And in uh, 
his parents decided to subsidize him, giving him $100 a month. And in September 1950, he went to Paris and then Rome, uh, but his stay was brief there. In late 1950, he departed for Venice in search of history. So if we could go to the next, yeah, great. Um, I think that, let's go to the next one first. Uh, that, that's good. Um, now, uh, he studied uh, figure composition. Uh, he learned murals and, um, also, and he was eager to learn, uh, and he was inspired by Tintoretto, and he uh, composed, I guess we have to go to the next one, uh, uh, monumental uh, figures of really strapping Venetian workmen um, whose physical exertions uh, seemed to explode from the, from the canvas. Um, and he also, could we go back one? Yeah. Um, no, back one forward, one forward, sorry. <laughs> um, and these are sort of, he also did uh, genre scenes of the street life in uh, Venice and these sort of, these quieter figures of, of uh, in gardens and architect and various architectural views. And could we go back to the, the previous one, which is the church? Um, and this is quite wonderful, this um, church, uh, the Santa Maria della Salute, which is sort of the calm, blended surface of the church and his surroundings are, are played against the rather turbulently rendered sky above the, uh, the basilica and its domes. And uh, this church was painted by Canaletto, Gu Guardi, Turner, and Sargent, but um, Resica made the motif his own with very elegant demarcations of spatial zones. I mean, the church does rise imposingly, but it rises in the background and very softly, I think like a vision in a dream. Um, the figures at the lower edge are almost invisible at first. Um, the masks rise um, as subtle echoes of the spires of the great church. And I think that you see that uh, Rezica uh, puts the scene, really he's standing across, and it's really from the fisherman's point of view, and you have the beauty of the ordinary kind of holding its own against this glorious architectural uh, panoply. Um, uh, there are seats up here, if there are seats in the front row. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's all right, that's all right. Um, um, so Rezica returned to New York in 1953. He was technically um, equipped to paint complex compositions in the grand manner, but he felt disoriented and out of place because it didn't work out, he said. When I came back to America, I didn't have the same impulse to do these pictures. And he was trying to also reinvent himself as the follower of the Venetian school. He just wasn't in harmony with his friends, let alone the larger New York art scene dominated by abstract expressionism. I mean, the old Hoffman crowd is exemplified by Robert De Niro, Wolf Kahn, Nell Blaine, and Paul Georges were working from nature and in ways inflected by French modernism and Hoffman himself. Um, next, could we go ahead a couple of slides? Okay, yeah, um, you know, uh, Paul turned to portrait painting and his first, he did several small moody heads that were inspired by uh, Tintoretto. Um, and these works kind of kept him exiled from contemporary painting, yet he persevered as this uh, self-portrait um, that you see. Um, you know, artists often essay self-portraits at times of emotional, physical, or aesthetic transition, either to acknowledge a turning point uh, or to take general stock of their uh, life. And this seemed to be true uh, for him in this 1958 self-portrait. Um, he depicts himself with a mall stick, the tra traditional tool used by painters to steady their brush hand, and of course, Im immemorial dis Im immemorially displayed by Rembrandt and his portraits of himself. So, is Rezica asserting his place in the artistic cosmos or doubting it? Did he wonder if the assumptions of the past should be the mainstay of a contemporary painter? Mm -hmm. uh, in 1958, there was a turning point, and Resica uh, answered those doubts by making a change. Um, that year, in desperation, Resica turned to landscape painting uh, because his portraits were darker and tighter and more miserable, he said. Um, he said, although I was still conservative, once you paint landscapes, you're entering the modern world, or at least the modern century. Um, he painted outdoors in upstate New York um, and in Bridgehampton with Paul Georges. Um, could we have, um, let me see, the no, um, Visitation, that one up to your right. 
yeah, the, now, the, the, uh, the visitation um, distills his efforts to infuse his work with freshness and immediacy without abandoning his classical antecedents. Um, you know, a shack uh, that appears to be the artist's studio is here in the foreground of the canvas. A window or a door into the far, in the far wall leads the eye to the surrounding trees, grass, and sky, uh, beckoning us beyond the closed-in world of careful naturalism into the freedom and openness of landscape painting. In essence, uh, Resica is, uh, uh, creates a vernacular annunciation scene in which the painter who is yearning for artistic grace is blessed by a revelation of color, light, and motif uh, that ignites an aesthetic rebirth. Um, in June 1959, uh, Resica rented a house in Bridgehampton and, and experienced his first long stretch of painting outdoors, and Corot became his idol. Um, could we go to Fairfield Porter painting? Uh, that one, yeah. Uh, and uh, once again, um, Resica was working alongside Paul Georges, who introduced him to uh, the painter and critic Fairfield Porter. And in tribute to both artists, Resica created this painting, which shows not only Porter, but a canvas by Georges and a silvery frieze of Corot-like foliage. Um, and then a view of Amagansett. Um, and then here, um, I think this uh, is somewhat more reminiscent of uh, Corot's uh, Italian scenes. So these, these landscapes and a more pronounced devotion to light once more uh, connected Resica with many of the artists he had first encountered as a Hoffman student. Uh, because he seemed to be part of a generation and a movement again, he was exhibiting more and was reintegrated in the New York art scene. Uh, by the early 1960s, the years of apprenticeship and exile were over, and the return to a bolder creative equilibrium was about to begin. So um, now we, so, yeah, go ahead. Sophie. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Sam really said this, but for the monograph, we each um, wrote chapters about certain chronological periods of um, Paul's work. So um, Avis wrote about the, the 40s and 50s. And um, Karen Wilkin, who was unable to be here tonight for this discussion, wrote about the 60s and 70s. Um, so I think we're going to just look at these images and go through them and maybe, and then I'll talk about the 80s and 90s and then uh, maybe we can come back to this period. Does that sound good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we should say that um, before Paul met Blair, um, he was married before and had a son, Nathan Renesica. And, I, and this may be Nathan. Is, uh -huh. it, is that Nathan? Uh -huh. Okay. And here is Blair, who looks exactly the same. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> who, the same hair, so whom Paul met in what, 64, 63, and they were married in 68. You can, you can really begin to see Paul coming into his own as a landscape painter, just how much brighter, you know, the handling of, of color is, is so much more assured and, um, you know, smooth, more abstract, less devoted to little detail, to extraneous detail. And you can see there he's traveling. <laughs> Um, one thing I liked in Karen's essay was that she talked about um, Paul translating his world into this Arcadian vision, but that she also talked about the paintings as diaristic, and I thought that was that was interesting. I've never really thought of them as diaristic, but I liked that idea. 
And uh, most of them are very much about their life mm -hmm. uh, in the summer on Cape Cod. You know, other than when he was a teenager, Paul never registers as an urban painter again. Okay, so we're coming to my section now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you want Do you want me to take over so you? Oh have no, to... I can do it. Okay, I'm good. Um, so this is Blair Resica's photograph of Paul um, painting in La Coste in the south of France, uh, and he was there teaching at the La Coste um, School of Art in buildings where apparently the Marquis de Sade had lived, um, and it's now part of an art school campus that's owned by the Savannah School of Art and Design. So in this, in this period of the 80s and 90s, which I wrote about and which I'm talking about tonight, um, Paul found meaningful motifs in La Coste, um, in Tepos Lan uh, in Mexico, and in Wellfleet and Provincetown on Cape Cod. And I feel that this decade really ushered in a distinct way of thinking about painting for Resica. I think that while he was still responding to nature, he began more overtly constructing and proposing the scenes that he painted and really reducing the motifs to their essentials, to um, kind of iconic elements in this period. <coughs> He began thinking about how to do more with less, really paring down the paintings to their essential parts and components, and was turning the subjects into these fundamental forms and volumes. In other words, I would say that he constructed a universe within his painting that stemmed from his own proposal. So his dark portraits of the 50s that we were just looking at and his um, tonal plein air landscapes of the 70s gave way to more symbolic, um, saturated color. And he continued to work outdoors, but he was also working from memory um, and developing large paintings from memory in the studio uh, and became more focused on orchestrating form. Uh, I would say he began acting more as the architect of the scene. And he worked in series, so he made variations um, from the same motif, um, which he still does, um, taking control of the subject more as an icon. And although he repeated motifs, each painting really mm -hmm. maintains a specificity through color and light which conjure unique moods, memories, and also responses to art history. And the compositional organization of his work also changed in this period. Um, he often kind of closed in on the subject and compressed space as he does in this painting. Um, Yet, I would say he also maintains an emotional um, distance that suggests kind of dreamlike or poetic visions of spaces. I would go so far as to say he constructed a vision, his vision, of a kind of divine space um, and one which was completely connected to art history. And the events in his life leading up to the 1980s or 1980 may have contributed to this kind of shift in perspective. In certain ways, he really created his own art world. Um, in 71, uh, a fire in his Washington Square Muse studio right near here resulted in the loss of 300 paintings. Um, so for all intents and purposes, he really had to start over again. Um, and also, by 1975, he was working, he was showing at the Graham Gallery. Um, in 76 and 77, he participated in the founding of two artist-run exhibition spaces, 
um, the Artist Choice Museum in New York, and the Long Point Gallery in Provincetown. Um, and he also became chairman of the MFA program at Parsons. And there he really designed an environment um, for students where they were spending hours working from life, um, drawing and painting at easels as opposed to uh, sort of for more classes or discussion based, discussing ideas. Um, so he was able to kind of construct his own art world. Um, and in this, in this painting and others of this period, um, I thought about how the organic and the geometry really play off of each other, which I think is another hallmark of his work um, in this period and maybe throughout. Um, but they're also kind of melting together. The forms um, sort of soften into each other. So this uh, series of dune paintings, this was a, a series of several paintings, um, some of which are very large, are indicative of the kind of uh, stylistic shift that I'm outlining, where he turns them into highly symbolic representations um, defi defined by these broad color fields and these arabesques. Um, they're based on the path between um, the Wellfleet backwoods um, to the ocean, uh, where Ressica still spends parts of every summer. Um, and in these paintings, he equates the, the figure and the landscape. So the provisionally outlined figure is rhymed by the curving shapes of the dunes, both voluptuous. And I think of this as a kind of, um, this is a, a painting from Tepos Lawn um, as a kind of gendered male counterpoint to the dune painting. Um, like the dune painting about uh, solitude amongst uh, space, mid space. And um, Resica does away with detail in favor of these poetic markers um, the simple structure with its black archway entrance mirroring the black silhouette of the bull. It's kind of um, home and emptiness at once. So in several paintings, um, he includes the bull. Um, we were talking about his relationship to art history a little bit, and Resica certainly doesn't and didn't see any reason to shy away from this iconic symbol in art history, you know, from cave painting to Manet to Picasso. Um, they might not have the, they definitely don't have the overt violence maybe of Manet's bullfights or Picasso's Guernica, but I still find these, this series kind of haunting. It's um, conversion, convergence of uh, paradise and darkness, um, kind of an exploration of n how narrative can be communicated with only the most essential elements. And here you can see um, him really pushing further uh, with geometry and turning nature into these pictorial symbols. And, and I also find that a really significant part of um, Paul's work, this kind of dance between the pictorial symbol and the space of the painting, um, maybe similar to the, the way that we see in Picasso's work, that kind of dance, um, and playing with that tension. And here maybe going further with that by outlining the shapes um, with black. Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, really kind of taking on this, the, the bull as the symbol that it is of both virility and death um, without a kind of angst, but almost as a clear-headed acknowledgement of death and the beauty of elegy. Um, and I think Ressica's work really bears that consciousness uh, that places and spaces can and will disappear. Um, when, when I was writing this and I went through the images with him, he pointed things out to me, like that a huge portion of those dunes um, that we were looking at in the dune painting have disappeared. 
um, and that the Valley of Tepos Lawn is no longer deserted, and that um, Blair's mother's house in Tepos Lawn, where they stayed, um, is no longer there. Um, of course, painting is a way of holding on to things, of, you know, of moments, of people, of places, and history. And something I've always felt in um, Paul's work is that his mark that you, know, you can see in this image even, especially that kind of outlining mark um, where he turns forms into icons feels like a signifier of ownership, um, of claiming ownership, whether it's ownership of the motif, the place, or the art historical reference and the body. So the first um, painting of what came to be titled his Province Town Pier series was actually painted in memoriam to his friend, um, the gallery owner, frame maker, um, Herbert Benevy. And here the blackness really assumes more weight, a large building on the pier echoed by the smaller structures and the boat. In this painting, um, Ressica references the 18th century Venetian Bedutisti painter, um, Guardi, who was, who was known as opposed to someone like Canaletto for taking liberties with topographical truths and favoring atmospheric depictions. So in Ressica's painting here is really about that soft blue light that per pervades nearly every element of the painting. If you've spent time with Paul, you know that he has a massive knowledge and curiosity for a lot of art history. Um, and for years, he spent every Friday or Saturday evening at the Met looking at paintings. Um, and if you spent time with him, you sort of may recognize the intensity of that, of that gaze, really um, looking at other arts or looking at the world and kind of finding beauty as it exists everywhere in life. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but I just wanted to note that maybe more than any other artist I know, um, Ressica steadfastly refuses to talk about his own work in the ways that we've grown accustomed to artists talking about it in terms of content or intent or identity and meaning. And, and I'm mentioning this because, you know, in the 70s and 80s, in this 80s and 90s, the, the period that I'm talking about, the art world was really moving towards that postmodernist idea that art is filtered through and defined by identity. But Ressica suggests in his work of this period a more universal idea of nature and painting. Um, he's generally uninterested in communicating personal identity, I think, or in correcting history's wrongs. You know, he doesn't refer to, he doesn't consider art history a burden in the sense that many artists refer to the burden of history. He really tries to place himself near his heroes. Um, and the most he'll give us, if you, you know, talk to him about his work, is maybe a description of where he was. Um, an anecdote about making the painting, whether he was working outdoors or in the studio. But I think that the meaning in his work can be located in this relationship between seeing and painting, between perception and the, can and the canvas. Because of course, in moving from the world to the canvas, memory and time is always involved. There's the looking at, and there's the looking away. And I think um, the visual marker for this process is the factor of Paul's work and its layers. So up close, we find surfaces that are built up and rubbed down, paintings underneath paintings. So the, re the brevity and the economy in Paul's work cannot be mistaken for an improvisational painting process. He 
he builds up paint and he will knife the edge of forms. I think of it as a kind of acknowledgement to the poetic concreteness of Ryder and Courbet. And in addition, of course, as you're seeing, he works out compositional choices across the scope of a series of paintings of the same motif. But even as Ressica emphasizes the fundamental solidity of forms in the 1990s, these same forms increasingly begin to float amidst their grounds. The horizon lines are nearly eliminated in this painting and in this one. The, entrance, the, the entrances to these floating houses kind of open into the color grounds and when I wrote about this work, I was thinking about a statement um, by the painter Milton Resnick. Um, it was actually part of a talk that he gave here at the studio school where he correlated beauty in art with the quality of suspension. And I'm just gonna read this. He said, you can suspend something in such a way that it doesn't have movement motion or time. If you see all that immediately, it sets up a condition in you where you can't do anything. You suspend. You know nothing. You cannot do anything and you remember nothing. It's a very good condition because at that moment, you begin to fall. And at that moment, when something like that happens to you, you do something to save yourself. It is just that one act, the act to save yourself from falling, that in some way can become beautiful. So in paintings of the late 1990s, Ressica lets go of gravity, of time, and preconceptions of structure, and that dance that I was mentioning, that dance between symbols and solidity is at its most tenuous state. A painting like this on the beach is really about the elements, fire, air, water. It's a fusion of a kind of dream vision and memory, everything at its most essential and elemental. Oh. <laughs> Oops. Hi. <clears throat> I'm going to move this over just because okay. I'm blind. Oh, there he is. <laughs> so, um, whenever I look at one of Paul Resica's richy, richly colored views of boats suspended, in a solid plane, in a plane of solid color, the title of a Wall Stevens poem, It Must Give Pleasure, comes to mind. Started at the end of the 20th century, when Paul's a young man, and continuing into the 21st, this series of maritime paintings brings together solid forms and shimmering light, clearly defined shapes and their loosely painted inverse. As anyone who's been to a seaside resort town, such as Provincetown, Mass, where Paul Resica spends part of each year, will tell you the subject of fishing boats and dinghies sitting idly in the harbor is as common and cliche as finding seashells in the sand. Resica, however, illuminates this highly circumscribed world with the handful of invented, slightly off-kilter, geometric shapes transforming. Oh, sorry. Is that better? I wanted to blur my voice, but now you caught me in the end. <laughs> transforming an ordinary subject into an uncanny presence. Russica gracefully poses the boats between representational forms and abstract geometric structures without ever fully succumbing to either. The tension between the two divergent perceptions is one of the animating features of this work. And this 
painting of Zeus, 1999, 2000, you'll see that the shadows or the reflections are geometric and they don't actually reflect what's in the boat or the boat. You see that black shape in the back and the way it interlocks with the boat in front so that it's somehow both a space and flat. Um, yeah, and then he starts doing these aerial views of water as you're looking down. But how do you read the shapes? If you, Somebody said this to me recently, a woman, Alejandra Sieber, an Argentinian artist. Uh, we were looking at one of her paintings because she's going to have a show in Buenos Aires, and I was asked to write the catalog for her museum show. And she did a painting called uh, Man Eating a Hot Dog. And she said, well, you'll accept the shape as a hot dog, but you won't accept that shape as the man. But if you accept the shape as a hot dog, you have to accept the rest of the painting. <laughs> and I thought, that's something that Paul does. If you accept this one part of the painting, the fish, then you have to accept everything else, even if you don't know what it is, right? And then you kind of, you're captivated by it. You end up looking at it, thinking about it, think about its history, think about the relationship to Hans Hoffman, but then it, it comes back to this painting. Whatever the associations, the connections you make, they're there, but then they fall away, and what you end up with is the painting. And I think that's one of the things that really struck me or, yeah, about the work that he's done over the last 20 years. I think I first met him in the 80s and was taken with his work then. But the other thing I want to say is um, in America, a lot of painters start off like rabbits, but then they die halfway around the track. And they just repeat themselves. And the thing about Paul is he doesn't really repeat himself. He just keeps going into a new place. And then he'll call me up every now and then and say, oh, come over to the studio. I have something to show you. And the lovely thing about going there is, A, you're surprised. And B, he goes, do you think it's any good? Yeah. So there's a guy, you know, however old he is, still doubting himself, which I think is a lovely moment. So... You see these uh, things in color. And then the other thing that I want to say about him is so um, William Empson once said that you couldn't write a sestina, and he gave the six words you couldn't use in a sestina. And then W.H. Auden, of course, wrote one of the greatest sestinas ever written. If you think about flower paintings, Paul's making flower paintings fresh in some way, and that's really striking, because it's like, how many flower paintings have you seen? And you go, oh, another flower painting, right? And the Arcadian is, I think, the really, uh, the right word. He seems to, um, there's this theory that there's two kinds of paintings coming out of Christianity. There's the kind where you feel guilty and are full of sin, and there's the kind that said, we didn't actually get thrown out of paradise. Mm -hmm. they, all the others got it wrong. And I like that vision more. And I think Paul's in that place. Okay, You don't, you don't feel like there's a lot of guilt running through Paul's work. <laughs> like, pleasure is pleasure. Why not have it, right? And then the other thing, these paintings. So... Later, you'll, uh, you'll see these paintings where, where he's referencing De Chirico. So De Chirico, one of De Chirico's favorite paintings, of course, is to the Isle of the Dead by Arnold Bockley. And I think of this as the, I, Arlen, his response to that gloomy painting of Arnold Bockley. Even though it is based on something he actually saw, it's become something else. The geometric, the organic, why is this going in and out? It doesn't like me. <laughs> Here I think he's moving towards the Kiriko. And then, out of the blue, he does this. <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing about Paul. You're looking around the room and you say, okay, 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 huh? 
That's one of the great moments in the studio. And here's the De Curico, which is very few people, and like Phil Guston would be the other, who, could, who took on De Curico and then didn't do De Curico. And I think that's really something you have to say, that it's his, it's a Paul Ressiker thing. But it has that eerie, silent, alternative reality, different world that you believe in, right? And then he does Moby Dick. <laughs> Did you see the bad movie with Gregory Peck? <laughs> I did. I was only about 10. I still remember it. Peck was not Captain Ahab. And again, it's like, what's that, tri that pyramid triangle on the right with a <laughs> circle in it? I mean, huh? I don't remember that from the book, Paul. We'll have to discuss this later. So then. <laughs> Recently, he said, oh, I have a new series. Uh, come to my house, I mean, come to my studio. And it was this, it's based on an etching. Uh, San Nicola de Bari. It's only part of the print, I believe. And he's done these paintings. And I've been thinking about them. Look at the, like, the shape on the right, echoing the sail. These three figures, I mean, this fire seemingly <coughs> behind the boat. Is it apocalyptic? What's going on? And um, this one, like what's going on? So the last one in the series, or I don't know if it's the last one, I think what I'm gonna show you next is Paul. This is the closest Paul's come to a recent self-portrait. <laughs> Right? He's the artist contemplating the universe. And it's geometric, it's full of color, and he's in his magician's uniform, <laughs> right? Because he knows artists are magicians, right? They, they do things that other people can't do, not even magicians. So I think that this is the place that we should end because I, when I saw this painting, I thought, that's Paul. That's the guy I've been known for like 30 years. And he's contemplating the universe. And it's all in his head, but it's all for us. <laughs> Again, thank you.